What's up guys, Tactic Zombies here. Hello and welcome to the first episode of my Call of Duty Zombies map retrospective series. In this video series, we'll be taking a look at every single Zombies map from Call of Duty World at War to Call of Duty Vanguard. For now though, we're going to take a look back at where it all started, Nocturne Toten, or in English, Night of the Undead. So first, I'm going to discuss the different features that the map has, both in its World at War incarnation and its Black Ops and Black Ops 3 remasters. I will not be talking about Die Machine in this video, as that is more of a reimagining and changes enough to warrant its own video once I get to the Cold War Zombies maps. As you may or may not know, Nocturne Toten originally began as a side mode that the developers at Treyarch made to pass the time when they were creating World at War. But it was such a hit behind the scenes that they ended up implementing it as a final secret mode when the game finally launched in 2008. Upon finishing the World at War campaign and watching the end credits, the player is secretly loaded into the Zombies mode. The mode opens with a fully animated cutscene, which would not happen again until Call of the Dead and Black Ops 1. The cutscene pictures a plane crash with a thick fog in the distance. Silhouettes begin to appear from the fog as the player's vision fades in and out, and then as it fades back in, something is running at the player, and then it reveals to the player what the mode is. It's the evil World War II German zombies. Ah, scary. The player is spawned into a creepy and desolate bunker with nothing but 500 points and the Colt M1911 with a couple of spare magazines to their name. There's a couple of guns on the wall, but they're nothing more than a couple of rifles, and there's barriers that the players can board up to keep the zombies out. The building might seem familiar to those who have keen eyes, as it's actually reused from both the World at War campaign mission to Hard Landing and the multiplayer map Airfield. This is a common theme with many of the World at War maps, but we'll get to that more later. With Noct being the first Zombies map, it's to be expected that it made some of the biggest contributions to the game mode as a whole. First are the aforementioned guns on the walls that players can buy, but there's also doors, the most notorious being the help door, a door marked with glowing paint or chalk or something that says help. Players can buy open these doors and also debris blocking their path for a thousand points. It's important to keep in mind that with Nocturne Toten originally, the intention of the Zombies mode was to keep the Zombies out. It was a tower defense mode, at least that's how Treyarch intended it to be. So dotted around the bunker are red barrels that the player can shoot in the last ditch effort to keep the Zombies from reaching the bunker. In practice, they're not all that helpful because they don't respawn and they're like, you know, never kill more than a couple Zombies, but it's the thought that counts. And on such a simple map with so few tools at their disposal, the player needs every bit of help they can get their hands on. Pretty soon the rifles in the spawn room won't be able to put up a good fight anymore against the zombies, so the players will be forced to move into other parts of the building. Most people will be drawn to the help door, and upon buying the door and walking into that room, they see the biggest ace up their sleeve that they have, the mystery box. The guns on the wall can only get players so far, as even the machine gun, the Thompson, the best gun on the wall, stops putting up a good fight soon. The best weapons the player has at their disposal are kept in the mystery box. <clears throat> the best weapons that the player has at their disposal are kept in the mystery box. That's more like it. Among the best weapons are the LMGs, the Browning, and the MG42. These weapons have tons of ammo and very good damage. So they're fan favorites, and rightly so. Molotov cocktails can be found in the box, but they're not really worth it as you're more likely to down yourself than you are kill any zombies. The Panzer Shrek, a German-made rocket launcher, is a death sentence to anyone who grabs it, as you're very likely to down yourself with it with how tight the map is. But the holy grail in the mystery box is the ray gun, zombies' first wonder weapon, and a fan favorite at that. The ray gun looks straight out of a 50s sci-fi movie. It's red, and it shoots lasers that explode upon impact. It's the strongest weapon on the game, or on this map at least, and it is so cool. But you have to be careful when using it, as you're not immune to the great damage it deals. It's very easy to dine yourself with it, so use caution when you get it. Another tool the players have are the occasional power-ups that drop upon killing zombies. And Noct is just the core 5, an insta-kill power-up that makes all enemies die in a single shot. The double points power-up, which doubles how many points the players get from shooting zombies, killing zombies, or building barriers. There's the Carpenter power-up, which rebuilds all the barriers on the map for the players. There's the Nuke, which kills all the zombies that are spawned in, instantly, in a fiery blaze. The best power of them all is the Max Ammo, which refills every single player's ammo supplies immediately. This is vital for surviving the endless hordes, as ammo is a very big struggle, 
especially once you start climbing into the later rounds. These power-ups help to create moments of anticipation, anxiety, they make the game much more exciting. So when you get an insta-kill and a double point, you feel happy, but you can feel very anxious when you're waiting for max ammo and you're starting to run out. It mixes up the gameplay and keeps it from getting too repetitive, which is a problem that this map has, which I'll get into that later when I start talking about the pros and the cons. Players can buy the debris to move upstairs, and up top, they'll find a cabinet that can be bought for 1500 points, containing a Car 98K scoped Car 98K sniper rifle. This just further helps to show the original design philosophy was to keep the zombies away. The outside of the bunker is open. It's foggy, but like you can see the zombies coming from a mile away once they get into the actual bounds of the map. So you can get the sniper, you can shoot them before they even get to the building. In practice, it's not really that effective, especially on solo, when you get so overwhelmed and they start getting into the bunker so fast. But in four player, I could see this being a pretty useful strategy to have a sniper on your team. The last really notable thing to mention is the grenade corner. Zombies is original camping spot. For those who are unaware, Camping in Call of Duty Zombies is a strategy in which you place your back against the wall or a corner and just let the zombies funnel towards you and you shoot them as they come. Nocturne Toten being the first map was the progenitor of this, and this is perfectly seen in the grenade corner. The original strategy was to hit the box, get some guns you liked, and then sit at the corner until you get overwhelmed, and then you do it all over again. This was long before training, not long before, but this was before training was created that was later in World at War, and we'll get to that. But for the time being, this was how people played zombies. And somehow, it caught on. And that's it. That's all that Noct has going for it. And somehow, it caught on the way it did, and we ended up getting more maps, and eventually zombies became a Call of Duty staple. As for the story on Noct and Toad, and there isn't really too much to go off of. There's a plane crash, and there's four survivors who are all Marines, and they end up hiding out in the bunker because they're zombies. There's no real characters on this map. The Marines don't have names, they don't have dialogues, they don't have any characters. Because again, this was just a side mode, no one really expected it to catch on the way it did, so they weren't going to put time into story. But it's crazy though how the zombie story is so complex and convoluted, for better or worse. And it all came from here. Now that we've discussed the original, let's take a look at the changes brought in the Black Ops and Black Ops 3 versions of the map. Firstly, in Black Ops, the intro is replaced with this. I still don't think anyone knows what this is, but the song is cool. The four voiceless marines are replaced by the Ultimus crew. We'll talk about more later when we get to Shinonuma. But they have dialogue, which, for better or for worse, kind of ruins the creepy atmosphere. Now they're making quips and uh, have just idle dialogue that they say. Part of Nocturne Toad's original atmosphere is that there was nothing aside from the sounds of the zombies and the ambience. And that's kind of gone now in the Black Ops 1 version. As for gameplay changes, there really aren't too many. All the wall weapons are the same as the World at War incarnation. The box weapons have been replaced by Black Ops 1 weapons. And there's a couple of new additions to the mystery box, but I'll get to those shortly. The biggest change is that now there is a mule kick on the map. A perk introduced in Black Ops 1, which allows the player to hold three, gu three guns instead of two. This perk is in every single Black Ops 1 map. So get ready to hear about it a lot when we get to Black Ops 1. There are also some slight differences in how the game handles just from being on the Black Ops 1 engine instead of the World at War engine, but it's not too crazy of a jump. So most people will be able to hop from one to the other with very little adjustment period. The two major additions to the mystery box are the Thunder Gun and the Monkey Bombs. The monkey Bombs are a tactical grenade that distracts the zombies when thrown. We'll talk about it more when we get to Doris, as that was where it was officially introduced to zombies. Aside from the monkey bombs, was also the Thunder Gun, wonder weapon that now stands alongside the Ray Gun in the Mystery Box. It can one-shot an entire horde of zombies forever, it has infinite damage. And so in theory, you think it would make the map much easier, but we'll get to that shortly, on why maybe it doesn't. At least not on this version of the map. As for the Black Ops 3 version, there are much more changes, and they're all bigger changes. First of all, the intro is back to the original cutscene, although they censored out the evil World War II Germans in the title card at the end and just put Call of Duty over it. This time around, all of the weapons, both on the wall and on the box, are Black Ops 3 weapons. There are no World at War weapons. 
All of the Black Ops 1 additions are still here, as well as there being some new ones from Black Ops 3. First of all is the Gobblegum Machine, which allows the player to run with a pack of five super-powered gumballs to make their game easier if they want to opt into it. I'm not going to talk about it much here, that's a Black Ops 3 thing, we'll get to it later. And then there's the Der Wunderfizz Machine, which allows players to spend 1500 points to spin for one of the eight random perks on the map. Again, talk about it more in depth later when it gets introduced on Origins, Black Ops 2. But these changes make this map much, much easier. That's also aided by the new additions to the Mystery Box. The Monkey Bombs and the Thunder Gun from Black Ops 1 remain, as well as the Ray Gun Mark II being in the Mystery Box from uh, Black Ops 2 Buried, which we'll get to that later, and the Annihilator Specialist weapon. Again, just going to gloss over these right now, but these two weapons, the Ray Gun Mark II more so than the Annihilator, the Annihilator is not really that good, but the Mark II especially helps to really make this map much easier than its other incarnations. At least, again, in theory. All in all, Black Ops 3 is a much greater deviation from the original World at War Nocturne Toten than Black Ops 1's version is. I'd like to really briefly mention the biggest change between World at War compared to the Black Ops 1 and 3 versions is the way zombie spawning works. On World at War Nocturne Toten, when playing solo, the zombies per round caps out at very measly 24. So, high rounding on this map is very, very easy compared to other maps in any of the other games. So even though Black Ops 1 and 3 have all these other benefits, like new wonder weapons and perks and all that to make the map easier, I think the World at War version is probably still the easiest just because of the very, very low zombie count, at least when you're playing solo. If I had to pick a hardest version of the map, I would almost certainly have to be Black Ops 1's version of Nocturne Toten, because it has more than 24 zombies per round, like World at War has, but it also lacks the gumballs and perks that Black Ops 3 has, as well as Black Ops 1's mystery box selection being one of the worst in the series. Many of the guns in the mystery box in Black Ops 1 aren't very good, but we'll talk about that more when we get to Black Ops 1. Now I'd like to talk some general pros and cons about the map. As for some pros, the map, it's, it's where zombies began. So even if you don't like the map, which many people don't, and I understand that, you have to at least respect the map for how much it innovated and that without Noct, zombies wouldn't be anything today, least of all the monumental mode that it has become. Another big positive that this map has going forward is its very creepy and unsettling atmosphere. The horror vibe is something zombies really had for its first two maps, then didn't really tap into very often afterwards, and I really miss that. I like when zombies is creepy. I understand it wouldn't be as effective if it was every single map, but Noct is still one of the creepiest maps, and it's only the first. Another pro is that it's just very nostalgic. Can't really put it any other way. There's lots of fond memories on this map, and it's held in a very special place in many people's hearts for a very good reason. Let's talk the cons real quick. Biggest of all is that the map just gets very repetitive very quickly, especially if you're playing solo. It's very small, and there's not really a whole lot to do. So after a couple of games, you'd get bored of camping and want to go do something else. Many zombies maps that came later have much greater replayability, and you can't really fault Nocturne Toten for it because it was the first, but it is still a big thorn in this map's side that even in Black Ops 3 and Black Ops 1, it doesn't really ever get passed because at its core, it's such a simple map that you can't make it too interesting no matter how many changes you bring to it, With aside from if you did a complete overhaul, like. Black Ops Cold War did. And finally, the map story is very, very bare bones, which again, not really something they would have planned ahead for considering Zombies was never meant to be the next big thing. But in comparison to many other maps, it's just, there's nothing really to go off of. It's just a little boring. Overall, Nocturne Totem was a very fine start to Call of Duty Zombies. It's still very repetitive to a fault, but with friends, it can be a blast to play, even nowadays. No matter how much it falls short compared to other maps that have released since then, you can't hold it against the map too badly because all those maps wouldn't exist without Noct. If you watched all the way to the end, thank you. It really does mean a lot. I'm still very new to this whole commentary type of video, so if you have any tips on how I can improve, please leave them in the comments and I'd be very happy to listen to them. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and subscribe. It would be greatly appreciated. 
hit that notification bell, and come back here next Saturday as we discuss Verruckt, a map that made some insane innovations to the zombies mode as a whole. See you then, guys. Tactic Zombies, signing out. What's up, everyone? Tactic Zombies here. Welcome to episode 2 of the Call of Duty Zombies retrospective series. Today's episode, we're going to be looking at Verruckt, which is probably the scariest zombies map ever released. So without any further ado, let's get right into the video. So first of all, the map doesn't open with an opening cutscene like Nocturne Toten did. Instead, it just opens up with a loading screen of a map of the map, which is set inside an abandoned insane asylum. Much like how Nocturne Toten was mostly repurposed from the multiplayer map Airfield, Verruckt is likewise mostly repurposed from the multiplayer map Asylum. I'll put it up on screen right now. Uh, you can tell the original multiplayer map is a lot bigger, but the actual center part of the map is very clearly the actual, like, Verruckt area. You can overlay it with the loading screen map and tell they're one-to-one. -one. This map does a really good job of letting the player know immediately that there's going to be new things on this map before they even load into the game. The three biggest innovations that this map made are the perks, the power, and the traps. All of these features would go on to become Call of Duty Zombies staples, and they all got their start here. I just want to quickly point out the style of this loading screen. I really like it. It has a very like creepy conspiracy theory vibe with all the pictures, and the map looks all scrawled out. It just really fits the vibe old zombies went for, where it's more of like a real-world conspiracy they were basing the story off of. And in particular, I want to shout out this one picture at the bottom. This always creeped me out as a kid. Uh, it gives me the same vibes as some like creepy pasta pictures if you grew out on the internet, like during that time, like 2012, 2013, 2014. Just really creeps me out, like the zombie's face with the small hand. They'll put up comparison pictures just to show like same type of pictures that it like gives me the vibes of. The first thing you'll notice if you're playing a three or four player is that the spawn room is divided into two sections and you can't get to the other side. So your team is split up. Still, even to this day, a very unique concept in zombies. It's only been done maybe two or three times since. But each side of the spawn room has writing in it that says power will reunite you. So already, players already have a goal set. They need to get the power back on so they can get the whole team together. The actual layout of the map can best be described as a big rectangular donut. The map wraps around a courtyard that is inaccessible, the square in the middle, and then the rest of the map is just the hallways and rooms surrounding it. So in the spawn room, there's a door that only opens once the power has been turned on, and power is at the complete opposite end of the donut, as can be seen from the loading screen. So the players have to go and open up to the other side of the map and basically complete the circuit in order to turn on power and then they open up the whole map. It's like just a big circuit basically around the courtyard. Since I keep bringing up power, what even is the power on this map? So as mentioned, at the opposite end of the donut, I'm just going to keep calling it the donut for now, is the power room. And when the players get to it, there's a big power switch in there with the hand that's cut off on the lever. You basically go up and you can flip power on. Whole map jumps to life. The transformer in the power room starts making a ton of noise. Everything just like turns on, like all the other new features of the map are only accessible once you turn power on. The door in the spawn room that was previously needed to be powered is now open, so the map is completely open now. Power is probably the most vital feature on this map. So one of the creepier features on the map is that once you turn on power over the PA system, a creepy song will start to play. And as I was doing research for this video, I found out there's actually kind of a like lost media search looking for a song that was used over the PA systems. The song that a lot of people thought it was is uh, this. I'll put the name up on screen because my German is horrible. I don't want to mispronounce it, but it's a German folk song, which, funny enough, there's actually a rendition of it that can be found in Red Dead Redemption 2 one of the songs Dutch has on his phonograph, which if I was expecting any sort of connection in this video to be made, it was not with Red Dead 2, that's for sure. Yeah, and although these songs sound similar, it's not it, which kind of sucks, because that would be really funny if the Red Dead 2 song was actually the Verruckt song. But the actual song was discovered like a year ago, like pretty recently, and it's called uh, Vals by Stefan Diaz. I'll put it up on screen. Shout out to Jessica Griffith on YouTube for finding and uploading original song. Thank you. Back to the actual song that appears in the map. It fits perfectly. It juxtaposes the horrifying 
just World War II, like, inhumane asylum with, like, carnival music almost. It's just really creepy and really well done, and it doesn't help that the map has so many other creepy sounds, like, screaming that you'll hear. And not like how Nocturne Toten had screaming, I don't know if I put it in the video, that you would hear the, the zombies off in the distance groaning and moaning. This screaming is, like, people screaming. And it's like, it's just, it's fine chilling, it's, take a listen. So let's get back to the other gameplay innovations. Now, definitely the biggest innovation that Rucked ever did is the perk system. Or pergacolas, as they're called in zombies. This was the uh, developer's way of bringing the perk system for multiplayer that was super, super popular and trying to put a little slice of it into zombies. And they pulled it off really, really well. This map only has the four original perks, which to this day I think a lot of people would agree are overall some of the best ones. And they're all mostly, well, not all, three of them are based off multiplayer perks, and we'll get into that. First off is Juggernaut, which is probably the most famous Call of Duty Zombies perk, and it's based off the multiplayer perk Juggernaut, and it basically just lets you take more damage before going down, and it costs 2,500 points. Up next is Speed Cola. This one lets you reload faster. It's based off sleight of hand from the multiplayer, and it costs 3,000 points. It lets you rebuild barriers faster, as well as reload your weapons, I think, 33% faster, I want to say. I'm not 100% sure. I think it's 33% faster, though. So, LMGs and shotguns, this perk is a must-have. Up next is Double Tap Root Beer. This one increases your rate of fire with automatic weapons, and... I'm pretty sure it lets, like, reduces the fire cap for semi-auto weapons so you can shoot those faster as well, but don't quote me on that. I'm not 100% sure. And this one costs 2,000 points, which for some of the slower firing weapons, like the STG and the MP40 and the BAR, this is a really good perk. Just be careful if you get something like a MG42 or whatever. You can blow through ammo really quickly with the increased fire rate. By the way, Double Tap is based off of the multiplayer uh, perk. It's just called Double Tap does the exact same thing in multiplayer. So last and probably least is Quick Revive Soda. This isn't really based on a multiplayer perk, like maybe because there's last stand in multiplayer, but reviving is a function in uh, campaign anyways, so this one's really not based on a multiplayer perk, but it lets you revive your down teammates quicker. And on solo, if you don't have teammates, it does absolutely nothing but waste your money. So if you're playing solo, you only really buy it if you're going for that rainbow perk challenge, aside from that. You could skip this one. Costs 1500 points. Lastly but not least are the traps. Of the three big gameplay innovations, these are probably the least important, but here they're pretty big. So on either side of the map, there is a electric trap. For 1000 points, you can lock off a balcony on either end of the uh, asylum, and any zombies that run through the electricity that's arcing are gonna die. But players, it's an insta-kill if you don't have Juggernaut, and even if you do have Juggernaut, it, like, takes you down to one-hit health. So, be very careful with these. It's very easy to go down with. Uh, Bouncing Bettys were first introduced on this map, and they're uh, little landmines that you can buy for a thousand points, and you'll get two new Bouncing Bettys at the uh, start of every single round. And they basically help the player you can lock down and try and fortify different areas of the map. These are honestly probably one of the more underrated innovations of the map, because Every single map from here to at least the end of Black Ops 3 would have some form of uh, Bouncing Betty, be it Claymores or Trip Mines or whatever the uh, like Claymore equivalent is. It all started here. Let's talk the actual layout of the map. The map can be split in half, basically going uh, left to right if you look at the uh, map from the loading screen. And these sides, the top side, has been dubbed the German side and the bottom side has been dubbed the American side. This is due to the fact that the German side only has German guns on the wall, and the American side only has American guns on the wall. As for what lies on each side, the German side contains Juggernaut and Double Tap, and then the American side contains Quick Revive and Speed Cola. Out of the two sides, the German side is pretty objectively just the better side because it has Juggernaut. The uh, way you get the power from each side, the German side has three doors to open, while the American side has five. So they're not very, like, it's not like how most zombies maps would, uh, going forward would have. If there's two routes you can take to get the power, they're usually the exact same number of doors. They just take you through different parts of the map. Not true here. 
here, you spawn on the American side. It's gonna take you longer to get the power, map's gonna get harder. So German side, pretty objectively the better side. American side's got some cool guns on it though, like the Thompson. The American side even has a useless door that leads nowhere, right into a dead end hallway in the spawn room. Just not a good look. The electric trap is even better on the German side because inside the actual balcony that the traps are like blocking off, the American side has two windows that zombies can still come and get you from, even if you have the trap on. German side only has one window, so overall, German side is pretty heavily, objectively, just the better side on Baruch. Speaking of guns, there's a couple new guns that were introduced on Baruch. The uh, better of the two being the PPSH, which is a, like, drum mag, SMG, rapid fire. It's awesome. It's a fan favorite for a good reason. It's just really good for points, good for damage. It's an all-around excellent weapon, and I'm really sad it's not on Noct, but it's on every World at War map going forward. It's been in Black Ops 3, been in Black Ops Cold War. It's been all over. It's an awesome, awesome weapon. Now, something I noticed when I was uh, getting footage for this video, which was probably on Noct as well, but I didn't notice it there, is that when you're using fire-based weapons, like the flamethrower, the molotovs, or the electric trap, because the electric trap sets the zombies on fire, is that the actual zombies character model will actually become burnt and charred, which I didn't know that. That was a uh, pretty neat attention to detail for a 15-year-old game. Speaking of um, guns that were added, it's really time to talk about the elephant in the room, that being the Springfield rifle. So located on the wall in the American side of the spawn room for a whole 200 points, the Springfield is the worst gun that's ever been in Call of Duty Zombies, period. Hands down. For context, the German side and American side both have a semi-auto weapon in the spawn room and then a bolt-action rifle. So the German side has the Car 98K and the Gewehr, and then the American side has the Springfield and the M1 Garand. Now the Car 98K, you know, it's not a very good gun, but it's hitting, like, one-shot headshots, so maybe round three or four, you know, and you can use it pretty reliably until maybe round four or five is when you should probably get rid of it if you're using it. Not the Springfield. The Springfield stops being a one-shot to the head on round two. It's awful. And the iron sights are wrong, so you're gonna miss most of your shots if you're shooting at something that's more than maybe 20 feet away, which with Verrucked and your early spawns where they're all out in the, uh, especially on the American side, where they're all either out in the woods or at the other end of the courtyard making their way to you, it's awful. It's the worst gun ever. Save the 100 or 200 points and just, like, get the M1 Grand. It's much better. And it's just... It's pitiful. It's pitiful. I'll have some gameplay up on screen. It's just, truly, it is the worst Call of Duty weapon ever, I think. Not even just zombies, I think it might be the worst gun in Call of Duty. Speaking of waste of points, there's also the uh, aforementioned useless dead-end door in the American spawn room. So for 750 points, you can open up into this little dinky hallway that just leads you down. Only thing in there is a wall buy for the BAR with a deployable bipod. Now, that sounds cool, Except you can't use the deployable bipod or deployable, like any of the deployable, because the LMGs are deployable, you can't deploy those either. Because it was cut. It was in the trailer, and that's it. There's like a glitch you can do, but I'm not even sure how to do it, I've never done it. It's just, it's pointless. And if you really want the BAR that bad, you can open up two other doors and actually make progress to getting to power. There's a BAR, like the third room you open on the American side. Another just pointless waste of points. The only reason I could ever see anyone opening this is if they need a camping spot when you're playing multiplayer. That's really it. So the Mercy Rocks does have one other item in it now, but it's not a gun or grenade or tactical. It's the teddy bear. So after a random number of rolls, the mystery box will eventually give you a teddy bear. And then at which point you'll get laughed at, and then the box will fly away, and then poof out of existence, and then a couple seconds later, it's gonna spawn somewhere else in the map. There's a bunch of set spawns, no, not a bunch, maybe like six or seven. I haven't counted them, but they're marked by piles of rubble on the ground with a teddy bear sitting on it, and then you can see like the top like panel of the box that opens. At this point, players will have to go out and look around the map to find the mystery box again. I think this is a great change, especially for the mode going forward, because from now on, the mystery box is more complex than just 
Oh, it's a place where you can just pay to get a random gun. Now I've got to worry about getting that teddy bear, and now I've got to track the box down again. And it's just great change. The mystery box is going to get one more change to it. That's going to come in Chino Numa. We'll talk about it when we get there. And there's one last gameplay thing I need to mention, and it's something that was actually exclusive to Verruckt for the longest time, and that's the Super Spinner Zombies. These guys start spawning in at round 6, and they are, again, the fastest zombies we had seen and would see for, I think, another decade going forward or so. Which, I think, it's like, it's like a peanut butter and chocolate combination. You have the most cramped, claustrophobic map we'd ever seen, and probably will ever see, combined with the fastest zombies we had ever seen and would see for a very long time. Because with normal sprinters, you know, I think the zombie sprint is the same speed as the normal player walk, so you can still keep good distance between you and the zombies just by walking on most maps, but uh, not here, no. These super sprinters will gain distance, they will chase you down, they're just... Overall, I think the Super Spinners were a wonderful addition, and they helped give this map a real sense of identity all its own. So, thumbs up. So now that all the gameplay has been talked about, I just want to talk about the cool little details and easter eggs on the map, because these are really what make Zombies maps, Zombies maps, is the details. It's the little things, you know? So let's get right into it. Firstly, and probably biggest, is the easter egg song. So by flushing this specific toilet three times, I'll show which one it is on screen. You get the song Lullaby for a Dead Man by Kevin Sherwood to play. Which, this is, this is a classic. Kevin and, uh, there's a Lana Siegman and a bunch of other singers who have done them. They're staples of zombies. Every single map's got one for the most part, except for Knocked because it was the first. But a lot of the ones, and especially Black Ops 1, would have more of a heavy metal vibe, which we'll get to when we get to that, but... I think this one is very unique, it's a lot slower, it's a lot more kind of creepy, I guess. Just overall, wonderful start for the Easter egg songs, still one of my favorites. Just a little extra tidbit is that this song was actually used as the Game Over song for Nocturne Toten. It's like an early demo version of the guitar riff was. Zivaruk is the first Zombies map to have an actual announcer. Because Nocturne Toten, when you got power-ups on Nocturne Toten, they would just say at the bottom of the screen how much time you had left, or just pop up on screen. Max Ammo, Nuke. Vruck going forward, they've got announcers. Insta-kill. This map actually has uh, Marines as characters, the same as Nocturne Toten, but they have dialogue now, and they actually have names on this map. This really was groundbreaking for Zombies map at the time. The four Marines are John Banana, Smokey, Paxton Gunner Ridge, and Tank Dempsey. You can keep Tank Dempsey in mind, because he's going to go on to be one of the main four characters in Chino Numa and then going forwards. You can stand under the showers and leaky pipes, and you can actually have like a water effect going over your screen. Pretty cool. Next to each of the perk machines, there are posters advertising the different perk-a-colas. And it's kind of cool because the Quick Revive one uses an old, I'm guessing, early concept logo. So instead of the guy coming out of the grave, it's like a EKG, like heart rate monitor little thing on the perk bottle. And then the Juggernaut one says Juggernaut Soda. So clearly that's still an early concept. Which I only noticed this going through for making uh, this video, paying more attention. It's pretty cool. The same as Nocturne Toten, the zombies when you're playing on solo is locked at 24 zombies per round at the maximum. There's a sign on the American side of the map that says in German, Warning! All unattended children will be sent to the circus immediately. Inside the power room, you can stand by this little like terminal here, you can hear numbers broadcast. And apparently the numbers are a reference to Lost. I've never seen Lost, but I've read online and I've heard in YouTube videos that this is apparently a number sequence from the show. So. Pretty neat. You can interact with the dentist chair in the German spawn room and hear this. You can interact with the morgue boxes in the American side of the spawn room and either hear a man screaming, a woman screaming, or a baby crying. It's creepy. Out of all the writings on the wall, which there's a lot on this map, the two most notable are one that is most likely a reference to a Bible verse about death, and then the other one is the date that a meteor fell. I believe in New Jersey or Pennsylvania is what I read. Interesting that they're setting up meteors as a point of focus. And that just about wraps up the World of War version of the map. Uh, I just want to go over the remasters really quick. Won't take anywhere near as long. There's 
not anywhere near as much to talk about with those versions. So I just want to talk about some of the neat changes that they make, for better or for worse. So in Black Ops 1, the loading screen was changed to be more comic booky, which fits in more with the aesthetic that they had going for Black Ops 1, which we'll get to later, but for Black Ops 1 and then parts of Black Ops 2, all the uh, loading screens were supposed to look like they were taken from a comic book, which this fits more with that, but I feel like it loses kind of the uh, creepy vibe that it had originally, so I'm not a huge fan of this change. The four marines were replaced with the Ultimus crew, which was the same that happened with the Nocturne Toten remaster, which not as jarring here as the Black Ops 1 Nocturne Toten because they did have dialogue on Verruckt originally, the Marines, so... So then putting characters in with dialogue isn't as much of a tone shift, because it already was dialogue, so it's not like we're knocked where they basically put characters in where there are none, and it kind of feels off in the Black Ops 1 version of Knock, if you, if you know what I'm saying. All the Mystery Box guns have been replaced with Black Ops 1 weapons, and all the wall guns are the same, except for the Springfield has been replaced by the Car 98K. It was so bad that they got rid of it in the remaster, which, you know, you don't appreciate what you got until it's gone. So, if, you know, if you really want to use the Springfield, you have to play the World at War version, which I can't tell if they're helping or hurting people with this change. I'll leave that up to you to decide for yourself. Speaking of new items in the mystery box, the monkey bombs are in the box now, same as they were on Knock. And then instead of the Thunder Gun, we get the Winter's Howl, which I'm going to keep it short. I'm going to save it for 5 when we get to 5, because that's the map it was originally on. But it's not that good. It's good early rounds, but by round 15, it's starting to fall off. And by round 20, it's not really good at all. So overall, pretty, pretty dooky Wonder Weapon, to be honest. The perk posters for Quick Revive and Juggernaug were adjusted, so the Quick Revive poster now shows the actual in-game perk icon, and then the Juggernaug poster doesn't say Juggernaut anymore, it says Juggernaug as it should. And speaking of perks, Mule Kick is on the map now, same as it was in Nocturne Toten. Basically, if you don't remember, you weren't there for the last video, if you don't know, Mule Kick, 4,000 points, lets you own a third gun. It's nothing too crazy. The Super Spinners were completely removed in the Black Ops 1 version because there weren't Super Spinners in Black Ops 1 zombies, so I don't think they were going to make Super Spinners just for Verruck. It's sad to see them go because they were the, one of the big unique features of the map, so them not being here really makes it not as fun as the World at War version in my opinion. Lastly, the spawns for when playing in solo were fixed, and now they're not stuck at 24 zombies around forever, so the zombies when playing solo scale as intended now. Which is, take it or leave it, because the 24 zombies was part of that, like, old World at War charm that knocked and rocked, and we'll talk about Shinonuma, Shinonuma has it too, but overall, I think this is a pretty good change. This does make this version of Verruckt much harder, though, than World at War, because there's no real the no real reliable way to kill all the zombies once you start getting up into the high rounds you can't there's no powerful enough wonder weapon to kill zombies forever so this version is much harder because you can't just kill tell you around with the trap anymore and that about does it for the black ops 1 version let's get right into the black ops 3 version the process of turning on power is a bit more dramatic now because the actual electricity doesn't uh, start sparking at the transformer until you turn power on so you don't turn power on, it's just dark in the power room, turn power on, everything comes to life. I think this is a good change, helps to give some more oomph to turning on the power. Black Ops 3 adds the Gobblegum and Wonder Fizz to Verruckt, where the Gobblegums have several machines throughout the map, but Wonder Fizz is located right outside the power room on the German side, right near the, where the bathroom is. All of the weapons now are Black Ops 3 weapons, both in the box and on the wall. Mystery Box now contains the Ray Gun Mark II, the Annihilator Specialist Weapon, and then the Wonder Wop DG2. I'm just going to save talking about the Wonder Wop for next week since that was Sheena Numa's where it was introduced anyways, but just know this is a much better Wonder Weapon for the map than the Winter's Howl could ever dream to be. The perk posters were all updated one more time, so now the actual bottles on the posters look like the bottles that the perk colas use in-game. And then the funny little dude was taken off the Quick Revive poster. I don't know why, I don't know who he is, he's probably a Treyarch dev. I hope he didn't do anything bad that warranted getting kicked out, or kicked out of the poster. He was like my favorite part of the map! It was the poster dude! Oh well, it's... Again, what can you do? 
Map also has a new Music League strike on Black Ops 3, which Nocturne Toten had this as well. I forgot to mention it there. Sorry about that. This slipped my mind. Basically, you can play hide and seek with these little music boxes with this uh, little girl, who we'll talk about her later. She becomes very important, but you basically can have to play hide and seek with these music boxes. You shoot them all, and then you get a free max ammo, and then the song starts playing. More Easter eggs are always a good thing, especially when they're little small ones like this. There were some changes to the actual asylum, like not the area inside where you play, but outside. So, first of all, to help with continuity, the gate leading up to the asylum now says 935 over the top of it. Get to why that's important in a little bit. And then the change I'm not a big fan of is that the map feels like they're a little too try-hard, a little trying to be a bit too scary, like the fountain in the mold map. They changed the actual statue on the fountain, that's fine. But now the fountain's filled with blood, the courtyard is filled with bones, the showers are running with blood. It's, it's a bit too over the top, like... You know, I don't know, it's just like, feels very creepypasta-esque with like, hyper-realistic blood and eyes, I don't know. Not a huge fan of these changes. And as for the story of Varuk, we really learn more about the story from later maps that talk about it, so I think it would just be best to save the story for when we learn about it elsewhere. So, yeah. That just about does it. Overall, I think Varuk is a much better zombies map than Nocturne Toten, and I know that might be a controversial opinion, I don't know, but I just feel like it did so much to innovate, and it's creepy, it's got such a unique atmosphere, and it's just... I love Varuk. It's one of my favorite World at War maps. I definitely think it's it's up there with the World at War maps for me. Even after all this time later, there's still no Zombies maps that quite have the same type of atmosphere that Varuk has. It's just such a unique and one-off map. I love it. I can't get enough of it. It's especially playing it for this map, or for this video. I've got such a new appreciation for the map, which I always liked Varuk, but now it's like... I think it might be one of my favorites, just because like how much deep diving I had to do, and... It, it's a really good map. Definitely an underrated map at that. Alright, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more. Uh, it means a whole lot. Now, if you have any thoughts on ways I can make the videos better, please leave them in the comments, because I'm always trying to improve. This is a very new type of video for me, these Zombies Retrospectives. And the Nocturne Totem one was received pretty well, but I did get a comment said, vary up the background footage more, so I definitely tried to do that with this video. So, yeah, I'm just trying to make these videos better and better with each video, so. Anyways, sorry, I'm rambling right now. But anyways, so be sure to come back next week, where we're gonna go all the way to Japan, to the Swamp of Death in Shinonuma. I'll see you guys then. Peace out. What's up, guys? Tech Zombies here. Welcome back to the Call of Duty Zombies Retrospective Series. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about what is arguably the easiest Zombies map ever released, Shinonuma. Let's get right into it. Let's get things started the way we usually do with the loading screen. So, for Shinonuma's loading screen, it shows a map of the map. Unlike Noct, it has no cutscene, which this is the format the maps are going to follow for long ways going forward. As you can see, it does have pictures of four characters, and these are actually the four players that you're going to be able to play as. Instead of just the marines that we had on Noct and Varuk, now there's an actual set cast you can play as. Later on, they get the title of Ultimus, but for now, I think they're just called the Zombies Crew. And they're all four different stereotypes from World War II, so let's give you the rundown on each of them real quick. First up is Tank Dempsey, he's a foul-mouthed marine, that's really all there is to him as of right now. Secondly is Nikolai Belinsky, a Russian who is addicted to vodka. You know, he has a bad case of the alcoholism, and he has way too many wives to keep track of. Thirdly is Takio Masaki. He's a Japanese soldier slash officer who is 100% committed to honor and to the emperor and his country. He's going to lay his life down for all those things if he needs to. Very honorable guy, I might say. Lastly is Dr. Richthofen. He's a World War II German because I don't think I'm allowed to say the actual title on YouTube, but he is insane and he finds way too much pleasure and joy in the situations he finds himself in involving the zombies. For anyone who wants some more in-depth details on the different characters, the game actually includes character bios on each of them, which is cool, because, you know, it's, they didn't do any of this for the Marines. And most of the info in here has been completely retconned in, like, the 15 years since they have dropped the character bios, but it's still... Kind of neat to go back and see what the original intentions were for these characters and then how they ended up. Because, you know, right now they're just stereotypes, but 
given time to like grow, these characters become some of the most fleshed out characters in any video game I've ever played. So I'm gonna keep an eye on them, see how they change as we go through the retrospective. Unlike all the other World of War Zombies maps, Shinonuma actually isn't based off of a multiplayer map. It does reuse assets for multiplayer maps, particularly Macon and Knee Deep are the two that I found had the most similar assets in them. But the actual layout of the map is completely original, and due to this I think that Shinonuma actually has the most unique layout of any World of War Zombies map in general. Out of the, like, not that there's much competition, but I do think it stands out the most. As for the actual layout, Shinonuma is basically laid out like an X. There's a center hub with four branching paths to the different diagonal corners of the map that you can go to. Now that's all taken care of, let's get right into the actual gameplay itself. Players spawn into the second story of the hub building at the center of the swamp. I think arguably the most eye-catching thing in the spawn room when you start off is the man hanging from the roof. He actually has physics, and you can use explosives to make him rag all around, and it's really goofy. If you get his feet stuck on this like little dividing wall between the two halves of the like top floor, he'll eventually fall to the ground, and if you stand on top of him, he'll actually like jump up and kill you. Not like jump up like a zombie, jump up like he'll bounce off the ground an inch and then you'll die. We're gonna talk a bit more about him in depth later, because he is important, believe it or not. Shinonuma is loaded with a bunch of different little details to help make you feel like you're in Japan as opposed to all the other maps that are set in Germany, which I think really helps add to the map's overall uniqueness and feel. Firstly is that in the uh, spawn room, the bolt action rifle, instead of being a Kar 98K or Springfield, is the Arasaka, which is the Japanese bolt action rifle. Statistically, I believe it's identical to the Kar 98K, but it, not, it adds a little extra unique touch to the map to make you feel like, oh, you know, we're in Japan, we've got some Japanese weapons now. It's a little small detail, I like it. The zombies on Shinonuma also all have a completely unique animation set, which I didn't really realize until I went back to play it for the retrospective. And their actual attacks are like chops and swipes and whatnot, instead of just swinging their arms wildly like the zombies normally do in these games, which I think makes these zombies feel a bit more dangerous, if you get what I'm saying. It almost makes them feel like they're kind of retaining some of their military training from before they were zombies, which this, combined with how the German zombies, you know, because again, I don't think I'm allowed to say the word on YouTube, they like march around and stuff, like on the lower rounds when they're like just walking, which like begs the question, is like how much do Call of Duty zombies retain from before they were zombies, and that's something that there will be a couple more examples of this we'll get to later down the line with the retrospective, but this is my favorite aspects is when a map will have something like this, it really helps to set these maps apart, which again, we'll get to more of it later down the line. And so Shinonuma does away with the power system that was introduced on Barak. So on this map, and this map only, in a World at War, at least all the traps and the perks don't need to find power to turn them on. They're all on from the get-go. Speaking of perks, though, Shinonuma is actually first of many zombies maps to have randomized perk spawns instead of having set perk spawns for every single time you play the match. In this map in particular, the way you get the different random perks is you have to open up the map by doors to get to the ends of the different branches that I mentioned when I was talking about the actual map layout with the loading screen. Because every branch formulaically is the exact same, where there's a section of swamp and then a building at the end, and the perks are in the buildings at the end. Once you open up the door into one of the buildings at the end, you'll see the perks shuffle in front of your eyes, and then one of them will randomly be picked and then drop down to the floor for you to buy. As you may or may not know, the perks on Shinonuma are actually supposed to be reskinned from the perks on Barakt, which this ended up getting scrapped, but they're supposed to have like vines and moss and just look all swampy and forgotten, basically. They did actually still end up getting reskinned though, and probably not in the way you think, which this is not something I had ever noticed until I went and paid full attention for the retrospective, but the perk machines actually have big price stickers on them now in this map, which they don't add any other map. This is just like the Shinonuma versions of the perks, as they've got big, goofy red price stickers on them all. This is because on Shinonuma, and only Shinonuma, when you go up to the perks to actually buy them, when it pops up with the hold X, or hold square, whatever your interact button is, but it's the hold insert button to buy, it doesn't give you the actual price. And my guess is that due to the randomization, they can't have like a, like, price display because the perks, it can be any perk, so I'm guessing they hadn't had it figured out yet how to have it display. So their solution was to put the big price stickers on the actual perk machine so you can still see how much it is, and it's not like hidden, they're, ve they're very big, it's hard to miss the price stickers. 
and this is just my theory as to why this is, but I like it. I think it gives the perks on Shinonuma a little bit of a distinct, distinct factor compared to all the other maps. And speaking of the four different branches of the map, let's talk about those real quick. So the four branches of the map, there is the doctor's quarters, the comms room, the fishing hut, and the storage hut. The worst is probably the storage hut, so I'm just going to get it out of the way quick. It's basically just three paths of swamp with a small little round building at the back. It's... it's... it's bad. I only ever go here to check to make sure what perk's there, and I'll buy the perk, and I leave. It's not worth hanging out here. It kind of sucks. I think the uh, third best is probably the doctor's quarters, which, again, it's just a big patch of swamp, and then the actual doctor quarters at the back. We'll talk about this one in more detail in particular in a little bit, because this has a lot of new, unique stuff, especially for the story. This is probably the most important story-wise, but, again, actual gameplay-wise, I'm not a huge fan of the doctor's quarters myself. Then there's the fishing hut, which is the second best in my opinion, because half of it is dry ground, and then the other half is swamp, and then there's an actual fishing hut at the back, which is a pretty, it's a pretty big building, so... And there's something in particular at this section I'll talk about, but there's enough space to play, and you can train in the, uh, you can train in the area reasonably well, so... Second favorite. And the trap here, we'll talk about it again, is just one of the goats, so get to it though a little bit let me just talk about the comms rooms real quick so the comms room is i think the fan favorite area because it's huge and it's mostly all swamp but there's like a dock that runs basically like i say about 75 percent of the actual perimeter of the swamp so you can run around on dry land for most of it there's only a small patch you need to actually go into the water for this is the most open area by far the actual comms room is pretty nice. It's a decently big building. I think it might be the biggest building, it or the fishing. Well, obviously, biggest other than the main spawn room, but like the central hub. But the biggest area is the comms room. Tons of space to uh, mess around with. I think it's the easiest area of the map. Overall, my favorite area of the map. Definitely number one of the four branches. As was previously mentioned, I believe the doctor's quarters are the most important story-wise because these are the quarters of Dr. Richtofen of the playable crew of characters. You can actually interact with this bookshelf here and you can hear Dr. Richtofen laughing. This is because story-wise, this is what the characters are here at Chino Numa 4, is they're here to get Dr. Richtofen's diary, which this wasn't something that was discovered until far down the line, but this is why the characters are here. Which I think before that, Shino Noom was just kind of an odd place in the storyline. Like, no one really knew what the actual point of it was. But the point is to get Dr. Richtofen's diary. The Doctor's Quarters also includes the zip line, which when you first open up the Doctor's Quarters and you go to the uh, back by where the building is, there's a little switch next to the front door of the building you can flip for free to activate the zip line. And so the zip line comes from the central hub building, down to the doctor's quarters that waits out front, and for the steep cost of 1,500 points, you can use the zip line to safely go from the doctor's quarters up to the second story of the central hub, which this is Zombies' first transportation method like this, which they would get a lot better at stuff like this as the actual uh, game mode would go on, but this in particular, the zip line, is more of a novelty than anything, like, it's fun. It's not very effective though, and the distance it travels is so minuscule, like you could easily just run there yourself. Like the top second story of the hub building is not exactly a hard place to get to. Overall, I feel like this is basically just like a worst case scenario item. Like if you're at the doctor's quarters and you're running out of ammo or you're about to die, you can hop on the zip line and you can go away, but like, you know, like how often are you actually going to be like playing and you're going to be like mainly at the doctor's quarters? Like it just... And I forgot to mention, if you want to get the zip line, let's say it's at the second story hub, but you want it at the doctor's quarters, you then have to pay 1,500 points to get it to even come down to the doctor's quarters. You can't, like, call it from one place to the other for free. You've got to pay for it to come back to you. So, overall, again, it's it's kind of useless, but it's still a fun novelty. I mean, I'm glad it's here, because later transportation methods and zombies are much better and much more fun. So, yeah, zip line. Yeah, I mean, I'll give it a thumbs up. It's not a very enthusiastic thumbs up, though. I don't know when I started giving thumbs up in these retrospectives, but I guess I am now. All right, so let's say you're hitting the mystery box for a gun you want, and you end up getting a teddy bear. Like, what are you going to do? Because on Varuk, Varuk was small. You know, you could do a lap of Varuk in maybe 45 seconds. But 
And it was all like a big like circle, basically. So wherever the box ended up, you would find it quickly. But with Chinonuma, it's much more spread out, and you have to go very far distances to actually get to where the box is going to be. So, you know, like what are you going to do? If the box moves, you're just going to have to go check every single different branch and just hope you find the one you want and don't end up like just picking all the wrong ones. This is where Shinonuma introduced the, I think it's safe to say this, the last big innovation the Mystery Box ever received is the light on the Mystery Box. So basically, when the Mystery Box moves for the first time, because it's not there when it spawns, like the first location in Shinonuma, at least on the World at War version, there's no light. But as soon as it moves and goes elsewhere, a big yellow greenish beacon will basically beam up into the sky from the Mystery Box so you can always know, okay, Mystery Box is at Doctor's Quarters, it's back at spawn, and this is such a just quality of life, such a perfect inclusion, which, again, Verruckt was fine without it because Verruckt was a small map all indoors, you could easily find the box no matter where it ended up at, but as Zombies maps continue to grow and have more branching paths, a feature like this, if they didn't add it in the bo Mystery Box light, it would cause for so much unnecessary frustration, which... Obviously, this isn't a 100% like uh, fix for like mystery box troubles because like Black Ops One will have some maps that are set like 100% interiors, so there really aren't any places where you can see a mystery box light. But they have creative solutions for those maps as well. But we'll get to them later. I don't want to talk about them now. I'll talk about them when the time comes. But mystery box light, two thumbs up. I'm giving thumbs up now for this video. I guess great perfect innovation. I think it's like, I'm surprised they didn't think of it sooner, which, I mean, I get why they didn't think of it sooner. They didn't need anything like it on Verruck, but honestly, I'm just surprised they thought of something like this, because it would be very easy for them to include the mystery box with no light on it in this map, and then people just get frustrated. But I'm glad that they had the foresight. Whoever came up with this uh, design decision of Treyarch, you know, pat yourself on the back, because Shinonuma features the return of the electric traps from uh, Verruckt. There's one at each of the different buildings at the uh, ends of the different branches, as well as innovating with a trap of its own, the Flogger. Arguably Zombies' is most iconic trap, the Flogger is a giant pair of spinning spiked logs that'll kill any zombies that run through. It has great killing potential, it can kill an entire round's worth of zombies if you use it well, but it can also kill the player, which, do be careful because Old zombie traps like this are lethal, especially if you don't have Juggernog. So, yeah, and I'm just gonna say that preface every single time I bring up the traps. Be careful around the traps, it's frustrating. If you're playing co-op and you go down inside the electric trap, then you're stuck there. And then, like, if you get revived in the electric trap, especially in World at War where you can't crawl when you're down, like, if you get revived and you're under an electric trap, you go down again, and it's just, it's not fun. So just, just be careful. As for new guns, Shinonuma features two of them. The first of which is the Arasaka, which I've already mentioned, it's just a new spawn room bolt action rifle. Which again, it's good, like, for the map, it fits the map well, but it's not a very good gun, because it's just a spawn room gun. You know, you shouldn't be expecting, not, like, anything too crazy. Speaking of too crazy, though, is the map's second weapon that it introduces, the Wunderwaffe DG2. This is Zombies' first real wonder weapon, because I understand that the ray gun is a wonder weapon, but the wonder waff, I'm sorry, the Wunderwaffe, that shit's, that's the real shit right there. That is the first actual wonder weapon in my opinion. So the wonder waff can kill upwards of 10 zombies per shot, and it has 3 shots in a magazine and 15 in reserve, meaning that with a full ammo you can kill up to 180 zombies with the wonder waff. I think the wonder waff is the gold standard iconic zombies wonder weapon. You know, it was the first, and I think it really set the precedent for what a Wonder Weapon should be. And in the grand scheme of Wonder Weapons nowadays, it's really, it's really not that good. There's so many more overpowered Wonder Weapons that have been released since the Wonder Waff, but I still think the Wonder Waff holds a special charm compared to all of them. And it might just be that it's the first, but it's a lightning gun, okay? It's cool, okay? It's cool. And even though there's so many Wonder Weapons that have been released since, I still think the Wonder Waff holds great value. I think it can be used, you can look back at it, and use it as like a gold standard to judge Wonder Weapons against. If it's better than the Wonder Waff, it's a good Wonder Weapon. If it's worse than the Wonder Waff, it's a bad Wonder Weapon. Speaking of first, Shinonuma also introduced Call of Duty Zombies' as first boss zombie, the Hellhounds. Originally slated to release on Varuk, they were eventually delayed, and they were, ended up being released on Shinonuma instead. 
So every four to six rounds or so, a dense fog will cover the map and you'll hear the announcer go, fetch me their souls, and then the dogs will start to spawn in. So the dogs spawn in the map in a big burst of lightning, and only two dogs will be spawned into the map at once, so you're never going to be too outnumbered by them. They make up for this lack of numbers with their actual speed, which they're very quick, and they also, especially compared to later Call of Duty zombies like Hellhounds, these World at War zombies are really, really beefy, like, health-wise. Like, they can take a ton of bullets before they get put down. Like, you know, other zombies games, the Hellhounds are pushovers, but not, not in World at War. World at War, these things are lethal. The actual dogs come in two varieties. There are normal dogs, and then there are flaming dogs. The normal dogs are normal dogs. They're like the standard. And then the flaming ones will have less health, but they will explode upon being killed. Once you kill all the dogs from the round, the last dog will drop a max ammo power up for you to reward you for your troubles. This dog round archetype has been the most common way of handling bosses in Call of Duty Zombies, where every four to six rounds you'll have a round where it's only special zombies or it's mostly special zombies, and at the end you get a max ammo. It's been done countless times since Shino Numa, and I think the execution here is good, but it's also a bit buggy, a bit rough around the edges, just because this is their first time doing something like this. I've heard people say that sometimes the dogs will just insta-kill you when they hit you. I didn't have it happen to me, but, like, I know I'd be really frustrated if that happened, but, like, one that happened to me a couple times is that you'll kill the last dog, and then the max ammo won't drop, and it'll drop, like, the next round, the first zombie that you kill, which... Again, yeah, not too big of a deal, but like, I could imagine if you actually did use all of your ammo and were really banking on that max ammo from the dog round, like, and you didn't get one, that could be really frustrating. So, again, they polish them up a ton and make it much more, I wouldn't say much more, they make it much, le much less buggy in later maps. Even, like, Darius, I think they're better there. I've never had, like, max ammos not drop there, but, again, yeah, Sheena Numa, very great innovation, kind of meh handling. I think the dogs would be really bad on Varuk, though, just because of how tight that map is. It's very claustrophobic, very close quarters. I think they're much better here, because there's actually a bunch of space you can use to manage, and you can work around the dogs much more easily here than you could on, like, Varuk. So, overall, I think they're a good addition. Again, just a little buggy sometimes, so be careful. And the last real gameplay feature I have to cover is that this is the last Zombies map to have 24 rounds of Zombie 1 playing on Solo. Because of this, Shino Numa is considered by far one of, if not the easiest Call of Duty Zombies maps ever released. Because, especially with the Wonder Waff, you basically, you basically can't run out of ammo. Because you've got 24 zombies around, and a magazine of the Wonder Waff can kill more than 24 zombies. You've got enough ammo for 6 rounds. And dogs come every 6 rounds. And the dogs, you can kill with traps, you can kill them with anything, and you'll get ammo. So, like... It's basically... You basically have infinite ammo, and, like... Because of this, the high rounds on this map, like, in particular, are just so outlandish. Like, the last time I checked, it was, like, round 11,000 or something. I wouldn't be surprised if it's higher by now. All it takes is time. I even tried to see how high of a round I could get to for this video, and I ended up reaching round 42, which, I mean, that's nothing crazy, but, like, again, I don't... That, barely ever play zombies to go that high of a round, and the only reason I ended up dying is because I was, like, getting bored. Like, this is, in my opinion, I think this is a very boring zombies map to go high rounding on, just because, like, it's fun for the first little bit, seeing, like, how quickly the actual round counter goes up It skyrockets on this map, but it's very monotonous, you're doing the same thing over and over and over again. I'm not a big fan. Like, if you like high rounding on Chino Numa, that's good for you, but personally, I don't have the attention span to play it for so long. But again, this is the last Zombies map to have, like, a round record anywhere near this, so... Again, this is, like, kind of the novelty of these first three World at War maps, is their records are so much higher than any other Zombies maps ever. It's not even close. And now that all the gameplay is covered, let's talk about the little details and easter eggs before we move on to the Black Ops 1 version. This map's easter egg song, The One, can be activated by interacting with the uh, rotary phone in the comms room three times. In the spawn room, there's actually a radio addressed to Peter McCain, who is the hanging man from the ceiling. He's actually the guy whose hand is on the power switch in Varuk. His radio is from Cornelius Purnell, who we'll talk about more way later down the line, and he doesn't really become like important until way down the line, but this sets up a couple of key features. I'm going to quickly summarize, because it's 
got a lot of information, but it brings up Element 115 for the first time, which that's what creates the zombies, so already there, they're talking about how dangerous it is. They mention the uh, DG2 experiments, like referencing the Wonder Wa. He mentions to find Dr. Richthofen and Dr. Maxis, who Dr. Richthofen is obviously Dr. Richthofen from the playable group, and then Dr. Maxis is a character who will become pivotal in the next map, Doris. And then he mentions is that uh, to go to Doris and that the giant must be contained, which that is a foreshadowing for the next map, Doris. So it's a lot of stuff here. This is really where the zombie storyline all started was with this radio right here. So if you want to listen to it, you can look it up on YouTube. Again, it's pretty info-dense, so I'm not going to talk about all of it here, but already I feel like I've talked about it too much, so let's move on. Out of bounds in the storage hut area of the map, there's actually a giant meteor you can look at, and you can shoot at it, and your character will give some dialogue. This meteor is Element 115, what was mentioned in the radio, and then what is the cause of all the zombies. So this kind of ties back with the Varukt, with the like meteors being a big part of like there's, like drawings on the walls and stuff. Like Meteors are a huge part of the zombie storyline, and this is the first time we ever actually see one in person. As was already mentioned, you can interact with Dr. Richthofen's bookcase in his office, or I'm sorry, his quarters, and you can hear him laughing. The zombies have a tendency to glitch through this wall in the bottom floor of the spawn room right here, like next to the stairs. I had this happen a bunch of times while I was playing. It's, like caught me off guard a couple times, so they glitched through and they attacked me, so be careful around this wall if you're playing the World at War version. And something to mention is that on World at War, the characters you play as are not at all randomized. And what I mean by that is that player 1 will always be Tank Dempsey, 2 will always be Nikolai, 3 will always be Takio, and 4 will always be Dr. Richthofen. Which means if you're playing solo, get used to hearing Tank Dempsey, because like you're never ever going to play as anyone else. I hope you don't get bored easily of uh, repetitive dialogue and quips. In the doctor's quarters, you can find a slip of paper referencing H-A-A-R-P, HARP, which is apparently a research station out in Alaska, which this will get brought up again later. You can see from the uh, swamp in the storage hut area, you can look up into one of the buildings near the spawn room, and you can read Tunguska written in one of the windows, which this is a reference to the Tunguska event, which is a, a meteor that fell and completely just flattened like square miles worth of forest in Russia back in the 20s I believe or like early 1900s which again meteors are a huge thing and was called duty zombies and lastly in the spawn building there's a slip of paper that says Die Glock Der Ries on it that you can find in a pile of rubble on the bottom floor this is a reference to well the Der Ries part is a reference to Der Ries, the next map but the Die Glock is a reference to a real world conspiracy theory about Die Glock which is a supposed World War II, like, super weapon that the Germans were building, which, obviously, I don't, I don't think it's real, at least I don't, like, I don't believe it's been proven, which, again, it's a conspiracy theory, but it's supposedly, like, an anti-gravity time travel machine. There's a bunch of different theories about what it is, but, anyways, that's not important, because it does show up in the next map, but not as an anti-gravity machine. We'll get to it, though, but... That's where the DG comes from, though, and Wunderwaffe, I'm sorry, Wunderwaffe DG2 is Die Glock 2. So this is like, again, this is what I love about old zombies, is it's all framed as, like, conspiracy theories and stuff, is that they, like, you know, the one, the Wunderwaffe is framed as the successor to the supposed real-world conspiracy theory weapon, which, again, these little details, I love them. They're just all over old zombies. And that basically covers World at War uh, Shinonuma. Again, that took much longer than I was expecting. There's a lot more to talk about here than I was, like, you know, originally expecting. But, anyways, with all that out of the way, let's get into these remasters. There really shouldn't be too much to talk about here. But I didn't think there'd be too much to talk about the OG. And here we are, like, 26, 27 minutes later. So, who knows? Okay, so firstly, the loading screen was changed to have more of a comic book aesthetic to it, the same as the uh, direct loading screen had done. Probably the biggest noticeable change is that the map is much brighter now and has kind of a bluish hue to it instead of green, which I'm not a really big fan of this. I think it makes the map look looks off. doesn't really look like Shinonuma to me. It's also a lot foggier than the original, like very, very dense fog all the time, and like not just on dog rounds. It's also just a lot brighter as well, which again, not a huge fan of. Peter McCain isn't as easy to ragdoll in this version of the map as he was in the original, which, like, it, it's sad to see that happen, because that was, like, the defining feature of him being in Shinonuma, was how 
you can get him to ragdoll with grenades. Mule Kick is a permanent addition in the spawn room, so that's the one perk on the map that's not uh, randomized. It's always in the same spot every game in the spawn room. Speaking of perks, the perks all had their big price stickers removed, so now they're back to just being the normal machines because the game actually displays the price and you go up to interact with them now instead of the original World at War where they did not. The character you play as is now properly randomized, so you're not going to be playing as Tank Dempsey all the time if you're playing as Solo. Now you'll get to play as any one of the four characters, which I think this is a great change. The only new thing in the mystery box in this version, well, actually, all the Black Ops 1 weapons are in the mystery box now, but the only real new addition to the mystery box here is the monkey bombs, because the Wonder Wap remains the Wonder Weapon in this version of the map. And when it comes to spawning, the zombies are no longer capped at 24 per round, and then the hellhounds will spawn in more than pairs of two, which actually makes this version of Shinonuma one of the hardest zombies maps in general. Like, this is a very difficult map, because there's no pack-a-punch or nothing. The Wonder Wap runs out of ammo pretty quickly on high rounds. Overall, this is, like, big step up from the original difficulty-wise. And that's really about it for the Black Ops 1 version of Shinonuma. It's basically just uglier and harder, and it has some different guns, and some new perks, that's about it. Not really a big fan of this one, it's kinda, meh. I think it's definitely my least favorite version of the map. Let's get right into Black Ops 3 with the loading screen one last time. So the loading screen for Shino Numa and Black Ops 3, it's the same as the Black Ops 1 version, but the saturation has been cranked way up. So it's a lot more colorful, but it's actually like, the picture's the exact same, just with brighter colors. Peter McCain is now completely rigid. You can't, like, move him with anything, with explosives, with grenades, rocket launchers, nothing moves him, which this is very sad. I think it's got to be the biggest tragic arc in any Call of Duty game. The downgrading of Peter McCain as the Sheena Numas go on. It's like the rise and fall of Peter McCain. It's tragic, really. Quick Revive replaces Mule Kick in the spawn room, so... Instead of uh, Mule Kick being the set perk every game, it's Quick Revive, and I checked in Solo and in Co-op. I thought this was going to be something where in Solo it's Quick Revive, but in Co-op it's Mule Kick, but it's always Quick Revive, which Solo I understand, but I feel like for Co-op I would have preferred if Mule Kick was in there, because it makes more sense. But overall, again, I'm, I think it's a good change for Solo, just because, you know, Quick Revive is usually always in the spawn room on, like, 90% of maps. So, overall, it was an alright change. Not, nothing too crazy. Same as all the other Black Ops 3 remasters so far, they add in the Gobble Gun Machine and then the Wonder Fizz Machine to the map, which again, I think these are good changes because they mix up the gameplay a bit. The Gobble Guns have locations all over the map, and then the Wonder Fizz is back behind the spawn room building, like right outside the door leading out to the path of the storage hut. This version of the map returns to the World at War version for like, aesthetic-wise, where it drops the blue, gray, foggy kind of look that Black Ops 1 had going and goes back to the just pretty swamp that the original had, which I'm all here for because I did not like the Black Ops 1 version's aesthetic at all. All the weapons are replaced by Black Ops 3 guns, and then the mystery box now has the Ray Gun Mark II and the Annihilator Specialist weapon as bonus items in the mystery box, because the Monkey Bombs and the Wonder Fizz were already in the box in previous versions of the map. And I believe the actual swamp water is slower on this version of the map compared to the others, because I actually don't know if I've ever mentioned that the swamp water slows you down, but it's on the uh, loading screen. It says that the swamp will slow you down, and it does but I feel like this version of the game has the slowest water by far. Like, I'll put up a clip, but, like, I got jumped in the water, like, by zombies. It's just... It, like, I probably move, like, half as fast in this uh, swamp water as you do compared to the others. It's very, very slow, so be careful with it. And that's all the major gameplay changes covered, so let's just talk about some small details, little things added, and then we can uh, wrap this up and talk about my overall thoughts of the map. There's a board in the spawn room with a, like, cutout map put on it, which I think this is a cool little detail, and if there's anyone who's unfamiliar with the map, this can help them gain their bearings, and even for most people who, you know, it's not a very hard map to pick up and play, I think this is just a nice piece of detailing, helps kind of add to the atmosphere of the map. There are new posters put up around the map, which a lot of them are, like, war propaganda posters, but then there's the one that I saw that I think is supposed to be, like, an old kaiju movie or something, which... Cool little, again, cool little details like this make the actual map feel a bit more lived in, which I'm all here for. Really boosts the atmosphere a lot. The comms room in particular has some really cool lighting effects now, with like a flickering blue, like, light in there. 
I just think it's really cool and adds to the atmosphere in there because it's kind of a darker area. To make up for Peter McCain not reacting to explosives the way he used to, now he reacts to the Newtonian negation gobblegum, which I think honestly might be better. I mean, just look. Now, I talked about the rise and fall of Peter McCain, but this is the rise and the fall and the rise of Peter McCain. This is like his redemption arc. The meteor has been changed to a big gray rock with blue glowing patches on it because Elma 115 had its look changed and origins, I believe, and then going forwards, instead of like just gray and orange, like actual meteors, it's got like these glowing patches on it. So they changed it here to help fit with what the kind of new aesthetic of 115 is, which again, I think it looks cool, but I think it would have been cool to see the old like black and orange glowing meteor in Black Ops 3 graphics, but this is still cool. Like it looks very cool actually. There's a new music box easter egg where you can play hide and seek with a bunch of uh, little music boxes around the map because you gotta start, you gotta shoot a couple pans in the fishing hut and then you can go and play hide and seek with these uh, music boxes and if you complete the easter egg you'll get a max ammo and then a song will play. I think the biggest downgrade, and this is a really nitpicky thing, but they remove the unique animation set from the zombies, which that was even in the Black Ops 1 version, how the zombies walked and attacked and ran, did everything differently on Shinonuma for any other map, but they got rid of it in this version, which again, it's a super small detail, but now the zombies at Shinonuma, like, they act the exact same way any other zombie in Black Ops 3 does, which is kind of disappointing, because their old, like, old, unique animations kind of help set them apart. And that's Shinonuma. Uh, I think it's just as innovative and varied, although in a ton of different ways. I think it did a really good job building on the foundation that Varukt had set, and kind of, whereas Varukt, you know, introduced a lot of base level features like perks and power and traps, Shinonuma took it a step further and they did randomized perks, new traps, they put power in the player's hands in the form of the Wonder Off, which I think the Wonder Off is the most important thing this map introduced because, you know, Hellhounds, Hellhounds weren't made for this map. They're made for Varukt and they didn't work, so they got shafted here, which, again, I think they've worked better here than they would have worked on Varukt, but I feel like the Wonder Off is definitely the most important thing because we would have gotten other boss zombies either way, but we wouldn't have gotten, you know, we probably would have gotten other Wonder Weapons, but we wouldn't have gotten a Wonder Off per se. And I don't think any other Wonder Weapon would have left the same level of impact that the Wonder Wolf had launched at the perfect time, perfect place. I think I like the Black Ops 3 version the best, honestly, just because it's got a lot of extra little details. And then second is the World at War version, because that's, you know, it's classic. And it's uh, easy, it's a very unique map, just because it's like, it's got the 24 zombies per round, but it's also very open, so it's very, and it's just a super easy map. And then worst is the Black Ops 1 version. I don't think I'm going to get too many people arguing with me here. I'm not a really big fan of it at all, personally. But as for my overall thoughts on the map, I I don't think I like it as much as Varukt, which I feel like that's probably a controversial thing to say, but this was a much more... I don't know, I got a bit more bored playing Shinonuma instead of playing Varukt, like, for these videos, I mean, because Varukt, every version of Varukt had a different wonder weapon. There was, like... There's a lot more stuff that changed with each version of Varukt, and then, you know, Shinonuma stayed largely the same between each version, which I probably better, like, remasters, but not as interesting of an experience to go through and play each of them. But yeah, so I hope you all enjoyed. I just want to say thank you for how well the Varukt video did. If you're coming, watching this one after watching that one, then thank you. It means a whole lot. Join me next week as we journey to where it all started and contain the giant, or whatever Purnell said to do, at Darius. This is Tactic Zombies, signing off. Peace. Hello everybody, Tactic Zombies here. Welcome to the last video of the World at War Zombies retrospective series. In today's episode, we will be talking about Darius, also known as The Giant. So now these maps are going to start getting a bit more complex with story and easter eggs and whatnot. I'm going to start splitting up these videos into three parts. The first part will be dedicated to the gameplay and the differences between remasters of applicable because not every map has a remaster. Part 2 will be all about the story of the map and part 3 will be all about the easter eggs and secrets that are on the map. Without any further ado let's get right into the retrospective. So we're going to be starting as we always do with the loading screen. This is definitely the most uh, gruesome of the World at War loading screens, at least in my opinion, because it's a bloody map of the Darius facility with, you know, like a finger, 
vacuum tube eyeball, just like sciencey things, you know. As for the actual layout of the map, much like Nocturne Toten and Verruckt, it is heavily based off of a multiplayer map. In this case, it is Nightfire from DLC 1. Unlike Noct and Verruckt, where their maps were only sections of the multiplayer maps, albeit very big sections, they were pretty big buildings, Darius uses much more of Nightfire space comparatively. I think having all this extra space at his disposal does just great things in making Darius have the most interesting layout of a map in World at War, it's definitely the most complex. I don't know if it's the biggest, Shino Numa might have more square footage, but it's definitely just the, again, it's the most complex, most interesting layout. Overall, just a big step up from the previous maps up to this point. The loading screen also tells players their objective on the map, to link each of the teleporters to the mainframe, as well as giving them their location on the map. As you spawn in, you're spawn facing a chamber of sorts with a closing door, as the loudspeaker makes the announcement that... Why don't someone go turn the power on? Because of how the players spawn facing the machine, it immediately gets them to go over and investigate what's actually inside the closed off area. A new player will likely see that it's called the Pack-a-Punch, but they probably won't know what it does yet. If you go up to investigate the Pack-a-Punch machine, you're also very likely to pass over the pad in front of the machine that'll say the power must be turned on. So, even if it's subconsciously the player already knows the power's off, there's this new mysterious Pack-a-Punch machine, and that it needs power to be accessed. You may also notice three big wires leading out from the top of the machine, and then going all throughout the rest of the map. This is just some really good game design on Treyarch's part, because it doesn't outright tell you how to open a Pack-a-Punch, or what it is, what you need to do, but it gives you enough clues that if you're perceptive and you investigate a little bit, you're probably going to put the pieces together yourself without needing to look up anything online. The player can also see if the map is set in your Breslau, which this just helps with the world building a little bit, nothing too crazy. And since Darius is the first map with a real objective to it, and is also just the most complex map up to this point, you can pause the game to see a simplified version of the map from the loading screen, which will remind the player where the teleporters they need to link to the mainframe are, if you ever lose track of your goal. So on Darius, the player has two routes to the power room, which this is the formula basically every single map is going to follow from here on out. Unlike Verruckt, which also had two routes to power, both sides are of equal length, because on Verruckt, one side had three doors, the other had five. Here, both sides have three doors to get the power, so you're not at a disadvantage for picking one side over the other. Both sides also have a door that is power locked, meaning you have to take the long way around to power. You can't just cut through the like walkway that's open, that will open once you turn power on. When you finally do get power on, the map becomes much, much more easy to navigate. Firstly, a bridge will lower, and that'll connect the two halves of the map, which were previously up to this point separated, so now you can run circles, basically, around the whole front part of the map. And then the two blockades, one on either side of the spawn room, will lower for the player, allowing you to return to spawn, because you actually had to drop down from the second story to get to power, and you couldn't get back up. This allows you to return back to spawn and make your way back the way you came. Now that the player has turned the power on, they can start looking into unlocking the Pack-a-Punch back at spawn. Whether you use one of the maps, or just explore long enough, or follow the wires from the machine, you're eventually going to stumble across one of the three teleporters. If you're still unsure as what to do, the characters will even give you a quote just to make sure you know this is what you have to link. I think we gotta link these somehow. If you stand inside one of these teleporters and hold the interact button, a 30 second countdown will begin. You can see a little pocket watch will pop up in your corner, letting you know how much longer you have. And you have to run back to the pad in front of the Pack-a-Punch machine and interact with that to link the teleporter back to the spawn room. The door to the Pack-a-Punch will lower slightly, and then as a reward for your efforts, you'll also be granted a random drop, which in this case, it was a max ammo, which is pretty nice. There are three teleporters on the map that must be linked to open up the Pack-a-Punch machine. Teleporter A is located in the animal testing area of the map. Teleporter B is located next to the garage slash hangar area of the map. And finally is Teleporter C. It is behind the power room and it is the furthest thing on the map from the spawn area. Once a teleporter has been linked, it also becomes available as a transportation method. Much like the Shinonuma zipline, this costs 1500 points, and it will return you to the spawn room, and it does send you to the same place no matter which of the three teleporters you use. And then much like when you link the teleporters, you will also receive a bonus drop, just as a little extra treat. These aren't very viable as a straight-up transportation method, because Darius is a small enough map as is. I mean, you literally have to run across the map in less than 30 seconds to even get the teleporters to work in the first place. But these are a really good save-me option if you're backed in a corner, 
or if you need to have a breather, just like, they're a better save me tool than they are a transportation method. The teleporters are still cool nonetheless, and we're gonna see them a ton throughout the rest of Zombies from here on out. These are here to stay. When the player finally links all three of the teleporters, A, B, and C, the Pack-A-Punch machine will be fully open for them to use, and oh my goodness, it's awesome. Pack-A-Punch is arguably Doris's greatest and longest lasting innovation to the Zombies mode, as Pack-A-Punch has become just as integral to the Zombies experience as things like perks have. As for what the Pack-A-Punch actually does, for the price of 5,000 points, it'll change your gun's name, give it a new camo, upgrade its stats, overall just turns your guns better. You could say it helps them pack a punch. Ha 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 ha. Most weapons get pretty standard upgrades, all things considered, but there are of course some exceptions. Arguably the most notable of these is the Colt 1911, the starting pistol. If you hold on to it long enough to get Pack-A-Punch open and then Pack-A-Punch it, you'll be rewarded with the C-3000 Biatches. It's an explosive pistol, does as much damage as the ray gun. Stuff like this is a great way to get players to think outside the box and try Pack-A-Punching everything because you don't know what might have some crazy upgrade that you wouldn't expect. I feel this helps make the map a bit more replayable. The Hellhounds from Shinonuma also make their return here. They function almost identically to how they did on Chino Numa, just with a lot of the glitches patched out. For instance, I never had a dog not drop the max ammo on Doris when that happened pretty frequently on Chino Numa. The biggest change though, starting on round 17 up, the dogs will start to spawn in with zombies during normal rounds instead of just being kept to their own separate rounds. They do still have their own dedicated rounds past this point, but they'll spawn in with zombies as well on normal rounds. As for new weapons, there are two. First is the Bowie Knife, it is a melee upgrade that costs 3,000 points, and it makes your knife a one-hit kill until round 9. This is really good for getting points early game, as if you can save up and get the Bowie Knife at like round 6 or 5 or so, you can just use that until round 10, and then you'll have a ton of points saved up and you'll just be loaded for the early game. The other new weapon is the now super iconic Monkey Bombs. These take the player's tactical grenade slot, and they are a toy symbol monkey with a big bundle of dynamite strapped to its back. The player can throw the monkey bomb, and then it'll start playing a song, and it'll attract all the zombies to it, and then after a couple seconds, it'll explode. As an actual weapon, these things kind of suck. Like, they stop killing zombies at a super low round, especially compared to some tactical grenades that would appear in later zombies games. The monkeys really shine as a utility tool. Like, the distraction effect will help you buy a couple of pressure seconds if someone goes down and you need to revive them, or if you need to pack a punch, especially on this map where pack a punch is way up in the middle, and you're on a little platform, it's easy to get swarmed. Overall, the monkeys are a very welcome addition, and I'm really happy that some rendition of them has popped up in basically every single Zombies game since. The Wonder Wolf also makes its return on Doris, but it is severely neutered due to a glitch that basically makes it useless on this map. Basically, if you zap yourself with the Wonder Wolf, it'll nullify your Juggernog, and this is permanent, and it's just, it's awful, especially on Solo, where you can't just go down and rebuy Juggernog. It completely ruins the effectiveness of the weapon. The weapon can be Pack-A-Punch into the Wonder Wolf DG3JZ, which it gets a really cool Pack-A-Punch reskin, it looks kind of like a bluish chrome. The lightning it shoots now is red instead of blue. Overall, I think it's a really awesome looking weapon, but it just sucks because, again, if you shoot yourself with it, you'll lose Juggernog and you'll basically ruin your game. So, as unfortunate as it is to say, just stay away from the Wonder Wolf when you're playing, at least World at War Dories. This is a real tragedy of a weapon right here. The Electric Traps also make their return on Reese, and there are three of them this time, which is less than Shino Numa, but more than Barak. There is one in the doorway into the garage slash hangar area of the map. There's another one in the doorway into the animal testing part of the map. And the last one is underneath the bridge that connects the two halves of the map, right in front of the power switch. The color of the glow around the mystery box, as well as the color of its beam that shoots up in the sky, is now blue, instead of like the yellowish green that it was on Shino Numa. This is how it's going to be on most of the maps going forward. Not all of them, but most of them. And then lastly is that the zombies are no longer capped at 24 per round when playing on solo, so even on solo, zombies will scale exponentially forever. This is how it's going to be in every single map going forward, so you better get used to it. The sad thing is that there's no more records that are like around 10,000 plus though. And that about does it for the original version of Doris. Let's get right into the Black Ops 1 version. So starting with the loading screen, it has a much more comic booky and cartoony look than the one in World at War had. 
This version is also a bit toned down compared to the original. Like the finger is gone, the eyeballs replaced with a bolt. This one's just a bit more sanitized than the original one. The first big thing you're gonna notice is just how much brighter this version of the map is. Like this was true for the other World at War remasters on Black Ops 1. It's most obvious on Doris and Shinonuma. And like, you know, all the dark shadows are gone. Like this is just a much brighter, much less creepy version of the map. Mule Kick has been added to the map. It's in the hangar area of the map slash garage right in front of the mystery box spot. All of the weapons in the mystery box are now Black Ops 1 guns, but all the guns on the wall are still their World at War versions. Probably the biggest change on this version of the map is that the Wonder Waff is no longer glitched. You can hit yourself all you want with the Wonder Waff, you'll never lose your Juggernaut. This is just a great improvement, as that was the big thorn in original Reese's side, in my opinion. And lastly, the character you play as is now randomized, so you can be playing solo, and you can play as Takeo, for example, or Rick Toffin, or Nikolai. You can play as anyone when playing solo now. You know, there's not a whole lot of character quotes on the original Reese, and having to hear Dempsey's forever can get a little boring after a while, so this is a great change. And that about covers the gameplay. Note, I won't be covering the giant in this video, as I feel like it changes enough to warrant its own video, and I feel like it'd be a nice way to mix up the longer videos in Black Ops 3. Maybe I'll make it as like an addition to the Shadows of Evil video. I just feel like talking about the giant would fit more with Black Ops 3. I feel like it's got enough differences, like a different cast and different storyline stuff, so I'll save the giant for a later time, is what I'm saying. Overall, I feel like Doris is almost perfect truly did revolutionize zombies as a whole, and so many maps beyond this point would try and recapture the magic that Therese has, successfully or unsuccessfully, get to it later, but I'm gonna keep it brief because I'm gonna have a more in-depth conclusion later. Therese is just awesome, it's the best map on World at War by far, in my opinion. It's got the most replayability, it's got the most interesting layout, just overall this is a top tier zombies map. So without any further ado, let's get right into the story segment of the video. Okay, so I'm going to be frank, this isn't going to be the most in-depth story analysis ever because I'm not really the person for that. I know enough about the zombie story, but I don't know everything. So think of this more as a thorough summary than as a deep, in-depth analysis. I will be a bit more in-depth with Doris just because there isn't as much to talk about, but like on future maps, especially like in the Black Ops 3, Black Ops 4, I'm just going to give a quicker rundown because there's stuff about those games I still don't know, like even to this day. So Doris tells its story through seven radios hidden throughout the map, and this really was the beginning of the zombie's timeline as far as we knew for the longest time. So I'm going to give a rundown of the radios, I'm going to summarize each of them in the order that I think makes the most sense. I don't know if there's another, like, official chronological order for the radios, but this is the order that from listening to them and reading transcripts, they fit together most neatly, in my opinion, in this order. So, let's get right into it. So the first radio can be found on a shelf directly in front of Teleporter C. Dr. Maxis and Dr. Richtofen are running teleporter tests, and this is test number three. The test fails, and it even sounds like the test subject is liquefied since they need to clean up the teleporter afterwards, but they immediately get ready to run another test. The second radio is located in the tunnel that runs underneath Maxis's office, directly underneath the quick revive machine. It is hidden off behind these little wooden boards back here. It took me a little while to find. This radio is the wordiest out of all of them, so I'll try and be quick, but this is probably going to be the longest summary. The DG2 tests are far exceeding the expectations of Group 935, so Maxis wants additional funding so they can mass produce within a couple of years. Maxis also needs a more consistent source of Element 115, otherwise they won't be able to mass produce. The teleporters also aren't liquefying people anymore, but it sounds like they're leaving you in a vegetative state instead where you're unresponsive. Maxis wants to increase the scope of experiments at Group 935, and to do so he needs a bigger source of 115 and also a larger energy conduit is what he refers to it as. He also mentions that apparently Group 935 spies have found out that the Americans have a big source of 115 at the Nevada base, which I'm pretty sure is supposed to be Area 51. Like, I'm almost certain it's Area 51. Then he basically signs off the letter asking for money and says he's willing to discuss more with the actual High Command if they get back to him. Raider number 3 is located inside of the animal testing area of the map. It is in this radio that we were introduced to Max's daughter Samantha. She's going to be a very huge player in the zombie storyline. Maxis gives Samantha a pet dog named Fluffy and basically tells her how big of a responsibility this is, especially because Fluffy is pregnant and to be careful with her. Sam asks if they can keep the puppies, to which Maxis says they'll have to see. Radio 4 can be found in the spawn room in this little alcove next to this barrel. In the radio you can hear Maxis ordering around a zombie, to which it complies at first. Eventually the zombie attacks Maxis and it is shot. 
Maxis then immediately asks for another zombie to be brought into the testing area. Radio number 5 has Maxis and Richtoff and tying Fluffy down for teleporter test number 5. They power on the teleporter and Fluffy's gone, and Richtofen is just so excited over this, but Maxis is more worried because Fluffy hasn't reappeared anywhere, so they shut down the mainframe and get ready for test number 6. Test number 5 is declared a failure by Maxis. Radio number 6 we found directly under teleporter A in the animal testing area of the map. Richtofen and Maxis are preparing for teleporter test number 6. Maxis accuses Richtofen of having set up the teleporter incorrectly, but then you can hear a hellhound spawn in behind them. Fluffy has now reappeared, but she has become the first hellhound. Somehow Samantha has gotten into the test chamber, and she asks Maxis what happened to Fluffy. Maxis reassures his daughter that that isn't Fluffy anymore, and he tells her to stand by him for safety. All of a sudden, Richtofen seals Dr. Maxis and Samantha inside of the teleporter. Maxis pleads Richtofen to let them out of the teleporter, but Richtofen does not. Instead, he activates the teleporter and sends the two Maxises to who knows where before laughing maniacally as the radio ends. The final radio can be found in the teleporter B room on this ladder connected to this tank. The radio is recorded by Dr. H. Porter at the fall of the Doris facility. You can hear an alarm, gunshots, zombies, just all hell is breaking loose. Porter prays that God will forgive them for what they've done before killing himself. And that's the Doris story. There's nothing too crazy, especially compared to some of the maps that we get later, especially in like Black Ops 3 and 4, but this is such a very well fleshed out story, it's very self-contained. Like, this not only works great as a jumping off point that a huge saga could be built off of, like, as we saw was what happened, I think it also could have worked well if Doris was the last Zombies map, because it was the last map in World at War, and if we would have never got Zombies in Black Ops, I think this still would have been a nice way to finish up the zombie story, you know, it gives you all the answers that you needed up to this point, live enough up to theorization. Overall, super solid, sets a precedent for what all zombie stories will be from here on out. Overall, two thumbs up from me. Now let's get to the really fun part of the video, the Easter eggs and secrets. Let's get right into it. So let's knock out the big one first, the flytrap. This is the first real quest in Call of Duty Zombies, and even calling it a quest is pretty generous because there's only two steps, four if you really want to be generous and stretch it. First, you have to shoot this little panel, it's on the structure that's like out past where the zombies spawn, just outside of the front door into the animal testing lab. But you have to shoot it with the pack a punch weapon though. But when you shoot it, all these green objects will float up into the air and you'll hear. So that's step one. Step two, you have to go play hide and seek with Samantha by finding and shooting three of her toys that are now hidden throughout the map. You can find the toys in any order, there's no set way you need to go about this step. One of these toys is in a cage in the animal testing area, it's a teddy bear with a juggernaut bottle and a Colt 1911. Another one is another teddy bear, this one has a bowie knife, and it is a burning window overlooking the spawn room. Ow, you another one. The final toy is a monkey bomb located in a furnace in the garage area of the map, right next to Teleporter B. And that's the flytrap easter egg. There's no real reward or incentive to doing it other than an achievement that you get for actually shooting the panel and starting the easter egg. There's nothing you get for completing it though. I think this is more cool to look back and see just how far zombies quests have come because now the easter egg quests are one of the big selling points of a new zombies map, you know? So it's just cool seeing how humble beginnings they had. And that's even if you consider this an easter egg quest. I know some people don't. I do, personally. But like, I know most people would say that the first easter egg quest was on Ascension, but we'll get to that later. The easter egg song in this map is Beauty of Annihilation by Alina Siegman and Kevin Sherwood, and it can be activated by interacting with three glowing jars with brains with spinal cords connected to them. There are two in the back of the animal testing area, and then there's the last one, which is in the lab overlooking the garage, right next to Teleporter B. If you throw a monkey bomb into the furnace, this will happen. <laughs> Mr. Monkey, Mr. Monkey, to try to do 
there are maps at every single teleporter that show you how much progress you've made. Anything in red has yet to be linked, and anything in green has been linked. This is just a cool in-game way of letting people know how much progress is left for getting Pack-a-Punch open. I can see this being good in the public game back in the day, where, you know, not everyone's gonna have a mic, so, you know, the whole team's just gonna be super disorganized doing their own thing. You can see a bloody paw print behind these stairs in the tunnel next to Teleporter C. This is more than likely from Fluffy, the now zombie dog. If you go prone next to a perk machine, you'll actually find a quarter under it, and you'll see your points counter will go up by 25, or it'll say plus 25, but it'll actually give you 30. I think this is because World at War doesn't have like single digit point values. In Black Ops 1, however, it'll actually give you exactly 25 points when you go prone next to a perk machine, as opposed to the 30 that it would give you in World at War. This works with every single perk machine on the map, except for Mule Kick in Black Ops 1, which does not have any money hidden underneath it, and I think this is because Mule Kick was added later down the line, they just forgot to put the little easter egg in there with it. The actual teleporters themselves are supposed to be Dyag Lock, the real-life supposed wonder weapon that the Germans were developing during the Second World War. As for what Dyag Lock was supposed to do, if it was even real in the first place, theories range from anti-gravity to teleportation and time travel, among other things. As a matter of fact, Doris as a whole was heavily inspired by Project Doris in Poland, which was an underground facility where the Germans were purported to have been working on many experimental weapons, such as the aforementioned Dyag Lock. An example of this inspiration is that the structure that you start the flytrap easter egg from is actually based off of a real concrete structure that was located at the real-life Project Reese facility. Each of the teleporters has a hidden piece of wood near it that shows what the teleporter's original destination was intended to be. We can see that teleporter A was meant to go to France, teleporter B was meant to go back to Germany, which doesn't really make sense seeing as the map's already set in Germany, or like it was Germany back in 1945, but whatever and then Teleporter C was meant to go to England. In the tank on the left side of the Teleporter B room, you can see there's a pair of legs floating under the grate. Also from the Teleporter B room, on the balcony that has a mystery box spawn location on it, you can see a hanging man across the street in the building. I believe this is supposed to be Dr. Porter from earlier, and there's also a bunch of weird symbols written on the wall behind him in, like, chalk. And lastly, when you pack-a-punch with the Wonder Wolf on the Black Ops version of the map, instead of having the chrome pack-a-punch camo, you get a cool, unique, golden pack-a-punch camo, which this is, this is just cool. I like this. And that wraps up Therese. As I already mentioned earlier, I plan on talking about the giant when I get to Black Ops 3, as I feel like that'd be just a good way. A good way to mix up the more longer, more complex maps that are at the tail end of Black Ops 2 and then Black Ops 3, so I'm gonna save it for then. Overall, I think Doris is hands down the best map on World at War. I think it has the best layout, it utilizes the space the best. It's also not overcomplicated like some zombies maps can be, which, I mean, it had, they very easily could have run the risk of being overcomplicated compared to what came before, but they handled the jump very well. I also feel that Doris is the most replayable map due to the pack punch machine and it kind of incentivizing you to pack a bunch of everything to keep playing the map to kind of see what you like and you know see what weapons get crazy upgrades when you pack a punch on like the Colt and I know like the M1 carbine becomes fully automatic and stuff like that. It's real adds a lot more replay value than the other maps add up to this point. I also feel that Doris is the most challenging World at War map, especially compared to its predecessors. And storing here is a great jumping off point for the rest of the zombie saga as it's very tightly written and the way it's told, you know, the manner in which it's told, like with being secret radios you have to go out of your way to find, really hooked people in back when World at War came out and still, to this day, most of the zombie storyline is still told through secrets like this, so this really did set the precedent of what was to come. A map having a basically useless wonder weapon, especially on solo, is just a... You can't not excuse that, that's just really bad game design, and it's bad that they never patched it out, so that's the biggest fault to have against this map. The Wonder Off is fixed on the Black Ops version, although I think I still prefer the World at War version just due to its atmosphere being a bit darker, and I also just really like the World at War weapons like the Browning, MG42, just all the World War II guns I have a really soft spot in my heart for. The Black Ops 1 guns, you know, they're cool, but a lot of them don't really hold up very well when high rounding, and there's also just a bunch of duds in the Black Ops 1 mystery box. Overall, Doris was a huge step forward for zombies. I mean, you could even say it was a giant step forward. And I think it's very safe to say that Doris is zombies' first almost perfect map. And thus concludes the World at War Zombies retrospective. 
these videos were a blast to make, but I wanted to let you guys know I'm going to be taking a couple weeks off just to kind of recharge my batteries before moving to Black Ops 1 because I really don't want to burn myself out. I don't want these videos to turn into a chore for me. I absolutely plan on moving to Black Ops 1 soon, but again, I just need a couple weeks, maybe a month max, to just recharge my batteries and recoup. I will go back to posting normal videos until then, which are going to be more gameplay oriented instead of these retrospective long form videos. As for what games we'll be posting, it could be zombies, it could not be, because <laughs> believe it or not, I do play games other than Call of Duty Zombies, so I'm going to try and mix it up, because I don't want to be solely defined by my zombies retrospective, I'd like to have a bit more broad of a scope on YouTube. Real quick, I just want to thank you guys, the viewers, for sticking with my videos through all this, because my channel has grown from, I think, 35 subscribers to 175 by the time I'm recording this in less than a month, so it's crazy. I've been seeing maybe three subscribers every other week. Like, this is just... I can't put into words how crazy this is to me. To anyone who found these videos and subscribed and has been watching them, like, thank you from the bottom of my heart. It means more than you could ever imagine. Thank you. I'd also like to give special thanks to my friends Mom Tasty and Topaz Degree. You would also know them as David and Julian if you've watched my other videos. Uh, they've been helping me get the footage for these videos. They've just been such... They've been, like, really fun teammates to play with. Overall, I wouldn't have made these videos without them. I would have gotten bored past knocked. I don't think I would have made it to Verruck. So thank you to you two as well. I couldn't have asked for better friends to make these videos with. Alright, but this is Tactic Zombies. Signing out. Peace out. God bless. I'll see you guys on the flip side. Yeah, cause I got it like that. Flow so smooth like I got it on tap. Yeah, and I'ma say it be a good night while I'm on my yingling, while I'm drinking Bud Light. Uh, can you get it when you